Thanks everybody for coming. I uh, arrived here earlier today via plane and then rental car, so I know it's no big, it's a big deal to uh, drive anywhere to go see something and I appreciate that people showed up. Unless you live in this neighborhood and then I'm not impressed. <laughs> um, I, I am, a <clears throat> anytime I'm in the state of California when I do a presentation, I, it bears mentioning to me on a personal note that I am a native Californian. I was, I was born here in 1964 in uh, San Francisco and I grew up in Marin County and when I was just shy of my 15th birthday, I was whisked against my will up into the Northwest where my, uh, we've settled. My father is one of the original hippie studio glass pioneers and um, he had been spending the summers through the 1970s up at the Pilchuck Glass School. Everybody's familiar with the Pilchuck Glass School, right? right. Okay, yes. cool, because I'll quiz you later. <laughs> and um, if you've been in the Northwest in the summer, it's just, it's amazing. It, there, it's just the most amazing place. Right now, I left today, it was like 33 degrees and sleeting <laughs> as I got on the plane. And I've been snowboarding the last few weeks and it's just been awesome. And then to be here today, walking around 80 degree weather is just nutty. But anyways, my dad, um, you know, spent all this time at the Pilchuck School in the early 70s, or through the 70s, and saw fit for us to move up there because he wanted to be part of the burgeoning glass scene. My sister and I went kicking and screaming because we enjoy living the sunny California lifestyle. And... Uh, at the end of the day, we had no vote in it, and off we went. So we arrived there in, in uh, 1979, I guess, and I started to blow glass right away. Dad had friends that there was only just a, a few glass blowing studios in the entire state of Washington at that time, which is just crazy to think about when there are hundreds of them now. And um, I, was, I was just fortunate enough to be able to get to hang out in a glass blowing studio where, with my dad and his hippie friends and um, start blowing glass for fun, which is why anybody really ever does it, I think. And um, by the time high school was concluding, I was in really deep, like 1982, I had been around um, Dale Chihuly and, and most notably Benjamin Moore most notably Benjamin Moore, but also Richard Marquis and William Morris and all these greats of contemporary studio glass. And I was like, by the time, I, like I said, high school had concluded, literally, when I graduated from high school, I, I was like, I'm staying here, I'm gonna do this. My dad was like, no, go to CCAC. Go, go to you know art school. And I, was, I didn't wanna do it, I wanted to, um, hang out in the neighborhood and blow glass with all these people that I saw as being, that ended up being the great people of the movement. So anyway, one thing led to another and that's all I've ever done since, since then, since I was 18 years old. And I turned 53 the other day and I've had some time to reflect on being a kid who found uh, his passion as a kid, like I, I also, I think that's really central to um, the story that I'm about to tell you is that I'm a, an example of somebody who found what exactly they wanted to do when they were, you know, I was in puberty essentially. Because I didn't, I didn't realize how fortunate I was till I was a grown up and I started meeting other, uh, or my friends that, that I grew up with that that um, still didn't know what they wanted to be when they grew up. And I knew from the time I was 16 years old. So with that, I will start my slideshow. Basically what I have here is some images of some people who have been really influential, some objects that have inspired work that I've done, and then just a whole bunch of pictures of things that I've made. And uh, most notable is my dad. My dad didn't have a direct influence on anything that um, 
my, the largest influence really was just the exposure that I had, just the fact that my dad, my dad is uh, an unusual character. I'm sure Carol would tell you as much, but he um, had an, had a, he has three brothers and two of them are artists. And they, they're, the, he, he uh, saw fit to pursue an artistic life after my Uncle Joe and my Uncle Tom did. And um, he, he uh, I'm, I'm making a bad, I'm doing a bad job of explaining how it is that he influenced me because it wasn't like, everybody thinks that he like taught me to blow glass and taught me to do this and taught me to do that, but none of that's the case. It was just that I grew up around my dad's buddies and his, what he did. I was just, a, as a kid, I was observing this glass movement as it was unfolding. And um, so for that reason and for other obvious reasons, he's been the largest influence. But directly, there have been other people. My dad's younger brother, my Uncle Joe, is a painter in New York City has been a really big influence on me, uh, mostly from a, a sort of a uh, professional point of view and, and just what it is to be an artist and looking at, at larger things. My Uncle Joe makes these minimalist color paintings. That's an old picture of him. He doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> and uh, then also the artist Richard Marquis, who was also a family friend, a very dear family friend, and a, 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 a California sort of pop funk, one of the original studio glass artists as well, um, was somebody who continues to be a big influence on me. In fact, he was in my studio yesterday. He helped me make work. I just called him up and said, can you come down and help us? We're short. And he showed up from his island retreat and came down <laughs> and helped me. He hasn't sent me an invoice yet, but I'm sure it's going to be And then uh, this dude is Benjamin Moore, mm -hmm. not the paint guy, <laughs> the glass guy. He, he is he's somebody who, um, he's 12 years older than I am. He was a student of Dale Chihuly's at Rhode Island School of Design. And he, in, in 1980, when I first met him, or I met him in 1979, but anyways, he, he was the, one of the very few people that could make on center objects at will mm -hmm. in 1980. Like the, everybody else was just spinning open stuff and making goopy and more expressing themselves with <laughs> blow pipes and stuff. And Benny took this sort of design approach that really appealed to me. Additionally, he was a, just a super gentleman. As a pesky teenage kid, he really saw fit to uh, mentor me. And, and we be, we're life, we've been friends since, you know, but he made a bigger difference than anybody else uh, to me ever in, in terms of his work and just his character and um, his generosity. And I still am a big fan of this work. And I want you to take note of this piece here because later in my slides there's something that, that um, relates to that. And there's an image of, of uh, Lino Talipietra, the great Lino, whose object is right there, who's sort of the Elvis of this movement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Behind him is Richard Royal, that's Benjamin Moore, and there's me. <laughs> In, uh, yeah, I like the socks. <laughs> that was a great top. It's like 79. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. <laughs> 1983, I still had those socks. <laughs> there was a picture of Lino doing what he does best. Nobody's really had a bigger impact on the American studio glass movement apart from Dale Chihuly, who basically made it happen after Harvey Littleton actually made it happen than this guy because everybody was, was just trying to figure stuff out and... Um, and when I mean when I when I say that I mean like technique wise, because the spirit and the um, spirit of of experimentation and and artistry and sharing and everything else is already there, but n n none of the older people than me knew what they were doing, 
And then Lino, or they were figuring it out. I shouldn't say it that way. I don't mean to be <laughs> disrespectful. But Lino showed up and had all this, he had this amazing vocabulary of a, a language to impart to all these hippies. <laughs> and here it is, the Pilchik Glass School. That's pretty much, um, the, it, it, for me, this is sort of the cathedral of, of what Studio Glass, on the west coast of the United States anyways, has been. I mean, I know there's, I recognize some of you glass blowers out there, and I know you've been there. Everybody knows how important this place is. This slideshow that I'm, I'm uh, presenting to you tonight is in part uh, a promotional presentation for the <laughs> They don't pay me to do it. I was just trying to think. And as a young glass blower, everybody likes making goblets. It's like an easy thing to do and to, uh, to um, hone your skills. And I'm, I'm no different than anybody else. I, as a kid, I really, really got into it. It never really became part of my professional practice, but I did a lot of different things. I made lots and lots of goblets, and then they, they did sort of fit themselves into different little artistic projects that I did. This is just a wall piece, yellow in, a blue and yellow, I think it was called. This goofy chandelier I made, uh, these people approached me from uh, these developers in, in the city of Tacoma, Dale Chihuly's hometown. They said they were big fans of my work. Turns out they had been fans for like 15 minutes when they showed up at an exhibition at the gallery and said maybe he can make us a, a, a um, chandelier. It'll be so much cheaper than a Chihuly one. <laughs> and I did it. I pitched this goofy idea of these goblets and they went for it. So that's what that is. And I go by there once in a while and I see it's like full of coins, people tossing coins and stuff. <laughs> it would have been cool in a wine bar. And I made this as, this is a Lucite box. It's um, uh, one foot by three foot. And I made it for, my, at my, for, for myself in my house as an end table. And then we had a baby and it was no longer practical to have <laughs> in the house, so it became a sculpture and went to a gallery. And this, this is, uh, this, I, I, I mentioned the um, making wine glasses. This, uh, let me think about how to express the best way to say that what I do, and I think a lot of people that blow glass, it, it's, maybe it's not super cool to admit it, but it's very process driven. You know, you, 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 you get better. It's very crafty and, and you get better and you discover things and you see things at the end of your arms happening that then inform what you might do next. And I made thousands of wine glasses and this shape of the stem of the wine glass, they call the gombo in Venice. Uh, and eventually informed these things, which I called gombo vases, which are quite large. A lot of this work that I've done, which I'm gonna, from now on, I'm gonna show, is pretty much between a yard and a meter high, to give you some perspective. And these pieces, these gombo vases, were, were more about, I didn't really realize it when I started making them that that's what it was. It just seemed like a cool swoopy shape. After a while I was like, oh my God, I'm just making giant <laughs> goblet stems. <laughs> but it also, it also has to do in this particular case, and, and I like to embrace the crafty element of this, of joining the two bubbles together, like that red part and that blue part. To do that, like when you're making this whole, f this, this object, and as, as, um, as, as uh, you know, conceptually driven as you might think that this thing is that you're making, really, it's about that moment when you join those two things together. It's like that performance, that move. Not a performance in that there's a whole bunch of people watching, but it's just about challenging yourself to put everything together exactly on center at the right moment while it's this molten stuff and everybody has to... <laughs> stop, flip it over, join it together, and do it right, is the buzz <laughs> that you get. 
So those, I don't make this type of work any longer, but I really enjoy doing it. Now we move on to some objects that have inspired other things that I've made. This is a, a, a Tira Lundgren bowl that she designed for the, she was a Swedish um, ceramic artist that was brought into the Vinini factory in pre-war in the late 30s to design objects. Uh, Paolo Vinini was a really, really open-minded individual who saw fit to bring, he embraced modernism in Venetian uh, glassmaking and because um, up to this point, Venetian glassmaking is just what you guys all probably think of like gold leaf and dragons and all that stuff. Well, in the, in the 20s, um, Ven the Venini factory really embraced the, what they called the Novecento, which was the 900, uh, just meaning the turn of the last century, basically. And um, they brought people in from other cultures to design, and that had nothing to do with glass to design objects. And she came up, Tara Lundgren came up with this beautiful thing, which I have in my house. And uh, I sit in my house and it's in this child-proof case. <laughs> and I eat my cereal and I look at it and it informs me to make things like this, which uh, this work is from the 90s, but still, this is where, this is how it influenced me, was, you know, or I'm guessing, or I'm sorry, I'm not guessing. I'm trying to tell you that this is, I'm demystifying what it is that I do. Explaining to you what it is that informs me before I leave my house to go to my studio to make work. Um, it's not, there's not a big, there's not a lot of hidden meaning behind anything that I do. It's like really, I feel like I make things from a design point of view. And it's informed by about what we're closing in on a hundred year old design point of view for the most part, you know, and moving up into mid-century stuff. There's a whole lot of work that I've made that I consider to be leaves. And um, these are some of them, kind of fern leaves. Uh, these were more of a pea pod, same color scheme. This is a uh, piece from 1925 by Vittorio Zacchini. He was an architect in, um, in, in Italy who also came into the Vini factory. I found this little object in a junk store in my travels. And um, I knew about stuff like this before, but it's still, I ended up embracing uh, as an homage to the, the, those Zakin pieces, these things, which were quite, quite big and postmodern, obviously. And then, um, I'm gonna guess 1930, uh, Napoleon Martinuzzi made this piece. And I saw this in a book my dad had when I was a kid and I just thought it was one of the coolest things ever. And I imagined it was this giant thing, but really they're about that big. And I don't know how many they made, but not just a handful. And this Pulagoso glass, this foamy green glass with the gold handles, it's a vessel with 10, 10 handles. And then I made my own sort of Amish to it. And this is, the, this is the type of work I did through the 90s and into the early 2000s. Uh, this has the distinction of being the only image that I want to project tonight that I took myself. <laughs> Isn't that nice? <laughs> this is a Tapio Vercola piece from, from uh, it was probably designed, I think, in 1966. This guy is a, Vene a uh, Finnish designer, product designer, one of my favorite artists of all time. He made all this, uh, he did, designed all these glass objects. He, in Finland, he made knives. He's most famous for these knives in Finland. They have this knife culture in Finland. He did all this laminated, beautiful laminated birchwood um, furniture and stuff like that. I have this fantasy as a maker, as a guy who actually makes things. I spend uh, time at the Pilchuck Glass School in the summers where I'm the, what they call the gaffer and I, I go up to the school and then they have famous artists and the, the faculty people and other folks, whatever, that get an opportunity to, blow, to have objects um, realized by a gaffer. And that, that, that being me. And so uh, 
Tapio Verkla, that's all he did was just brought drawings, pinned them up, and dudes made his stuff. <laughs> and and um, I know all about what he did and how f I've been to Finland on several occasions and blown glass with those guys and stuff. And I don't, I hope there's no Finnish glass bars in the audience, but they're not like Venetian ones, glass blowers. He, uh, I have this fantasy that he went there in the late 60s or mid 60s and saw what these guys could were capable of and designed objects like this around these guys' abilities. Total fantasy. I have no idea if it's true or not. But these pieces, it's called a bole, and he, there was a suite of like a half a dozen objects. They still produce them, but they're nothing like they were back in the day. Um, were nothing like what he was able to or what he was, yeah, what he was able to realize when he was at home in Finland. You know, the, the, I'm getting a little carried away as a glass blower, but they, that is a really stunning, you have to take my word for it, because the picture is terrible, <laughs> object. And um, the ability to make that, like as much as I practice, I don't know that I'd ever get quite that good at being able to execute that thing. And I know who the dude was that made that thing a Venetian guy, he's, he's, he's gone now, but he was really special. I like the idea of being able to design around your skills. You know, it, 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 um, it doesn't really uh, matter at the end of the day unless you're somebody who makes things, but if you're somebody that makes things, then you can understand exactly how special that is to be able to realize the, the um, pinpoint accuracy it takes to execute things at that level. And this object is partially a reflection of that because it was put together in the same manner. When I say put together, I mean like that last piece that I showed you, that, that, that top of Verkula bottle was these open bubbles that are joined. And it really inspired me to start to pursue stuff like that. But around that same time, I also decided to pursue uh, introducing pattern into my work, which I had not done so up to that point. It had been all solid colored vessels and stuff. And um, in this particular object, I, I made that reticello pattern and then created this gigantic vessel, which unfortunately got broken. And, um, Actually, that's a little bit out of order because this, this goes back into the solid colored work that I make. And I love showing this slide because this, this remains my favorite thing I've ever made. I made it in 1992. It's a bit of a worry that I haven't made a new favorite thing. <laughs> it's, uh, I saw it recently, I was in Pittsburgh. It's in the Carnegie Museum and that one just really holds a note and I love that chartreuse color which you can no longer purchase. And then, and then we move into like the work that I've did and sort of built a career on was making this solid colored, all this vessel related stuff. Everything I've made has pretty much had a hole in the top. And there's not a whole lot to say about it. It was um, a really great way to, uh, well, to build a career really, if, when I think about it, because it was so not fussy, you just simply get some color, put it on the blowpipe, put clear glass over it, and make a shape. <laughs> it's not funny. I'm not, I'm not trying to make a joke about it. It was, it really, it's like, and here, this underscores everything. There's not even any kind of like, uh, you know, contrasting details. It's like, it just, I'm embracing minimalism in glass blowing right here, which, which um, is very close to my heart. And if you can, if you can make an interesting form, without just making a bunch of shiny, multicolored uh, things all over it, you're really doing well. And I saw that from the time I was a kid, I saw that. And okay, so in the late 90s, I did start it to embrace the pattern a little bit. And I made these objects, these, everything again is like a meter high. And um, these ones have the little, uh, oh, I can't even remember the name, what I called the, the uh, cane inclusions. This is a, another Tyr Lundgren piece from, from the late 30s, this leaf-shaped dish. I have one in my house. Um, 
I never really appreciated it until I saw how complicated and difficult it was to make. It always just looked like a dish that my, in fact, looked very much like a dish that my grandmother had with mints in it <laughs> in her foyer, and it wasn't impressive. But uh, I really, once I saw it made, I had a renewed appreciation for it, and I saw it made in 1996 up at the Pilchuck School. Lino Tully Pietra's brother-in-law, Keiko Ongaro, came up. It was designed by Tiro Lundgren, as I just mentioned. He, uh, Keiko Ongaro was one of the uh, great maestros of the Vinini factory, and he would have executed designs like this. And he whipped one out, he showed us how it was done, and it was just mind-boggling how complicated this little grandpa dish was. <laughs> But moreover, to me, what I really embraced on that afternoon that I saw, and then later acquired one of these, that one, is that scalloped edge. I Did like. start with a bubble? Uh, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it take, it, I can't do it without a chalkboard. It's not, it's not, yeah. So I did my own thing. The, I, I made these objects that, that kind of, um, are an homage to that. And then it, uh, it's also, this is when I really started to embrace making pattern, you know, making reticello stuff. And the reticello is this, uh, if you're not familiar, which I'm guessing very few people are, is this net pattern. It's been around for four or 500 years. And it's just really all about this mathematical precision, which has been something that for me as a kid, when I, my dad brought home these goopy, amorphous forms that he made, I was really intrigued because I was like, wow, it's not a mayonnaise jar or a lasagna pan or a sheet of glass. It's like this handmade thing. I'd never seen anything like it. And then when, before I saw Reticello's made, I saw these goblets that Lino Talipietra had made when I was like 15. And I was like, holy shit, dad, who did, how'd this happen? He said, oh, Lino did that, but whatever. <laughs> you know, because it wasn't, it wasn't the prevailing aesthetic was like, spin it open, okay, well, hang it down. <laughs> and, and this type of thing, this mathematical precision, though I'm not good at math, was still really, really compelling to me. You know, I just like, it took a while before, like Lino uh, was always telling, I'm very good friends with Lino Talipetra, if I had mentioned that before. And I've blown glass with him a whole bunch since I was 19 years old. And he would say, you should learn how to do reticello. And I was like, no, so I can make a bong that's reticello? I mean, what? <laughs> I don't have an idea. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't have an idea. And I'd have to back the slides way up to show you when I started thinking about pattern and thinking, well, maybe that would be cool to make reticello, you know? Anyway, by the time I did, I did have some ideas. It seemed obvious to me that if I didn't make a red cello acorn, somebody was going to do it. <laughs> and then these leaf things, uh, I actually uh, I revisited that series just yesterday. I made a piece like that. I haven't seen it because I left this morning. But I made one of those, and I haven't made one in probably 10 years. This is an, uh, my dad, <laughs> my dad has this vessel in his, uh, in his house with all these dried opium poppies in it. I don't ask him any questions. <laughs> I go upstairs and I, or I hang out with him after I blow glass because his, his uh, apartment is in the same building where my studio is. And um, I don't know, I looked at these opium poppies long enough that I thought I'd make one as well. And that's, I made exactly three of them. And then here's some other examples of some acorns. This picture, actually, uh, the photographer, when he brought this back to me, that photograph, I was just certain that I was going to really make it big. I just thought I was a genius for coming up with that idea for these different patterns. And I still have all four of those <laughs> in my studio. And then we move into making work with uh, Murini, which it's a little bit, there, nothing here is super chronological, but. Anyway, these pieces are made with, by, com by uh, producing Murini, which is a cross cut of a glass cane, all laid out, fused into a sheet, rolled up, and produced into a vessel. And here's a picture from back in the day of us, for scale mostly, and also, uh, yeah, well, mostly just for scale. 
I've done this collection of these, these, uh, these are small, like eight inch high objects. The idea was sort of born out of this uh, image in a, in a, a book. Um, that period I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the uh, turn of the last century, the Novecento, there was the Art Deco period in Venice where uh, a lot of really cool vessels uh, or objects were made that, that um, during one of the biennials, I think in 1925, there was uh, this great image, the black and white of course, of these vessels and they were just lined up on shelves and that was a page out of the, the, the catalog to purchase any of the respective vessels. And I just really like the composition. It's also um, a little bit out of Chihuly's uh, Venetian series, which came from the same thing that I was inspired by, that same deco period and Venetian glass making. And then it's, it bears mentioning my dear friend Richard Marquis making objects and placing them in these boxes on the wall and shelves. So it, there's sort of that trifecta there. And then I did a couple of big installations. These up again, these objects are about eight inches high or so. And these are some of my favorite things that I've done, the clear and black. And it takes sort of a more sophisticated uh, collector to really embrace this. Most people really enjoy the color, but I like that stuff. And then I started to make these objects. Uh, I went to Australia. I've been to Australia lots and lots of times and done glass there. And I created th these particular pieces around uh, the gum tree leaf, which is a eucalyptus tree. But Moreover, there was a laminated birchwood object from 1951 that Tapio Vercola did. I don't have an image of it, but it's just a plate that looks like a leaf. And uh, I've looked at that image. I have a book of the definitive book of Tapio Vercola's work in my studio. Plus, I've seen some examples in museums of those particular objects of laminated birchwood that he did. And I thought, you know, if he made that pattern twice, and uh, onto a plate and then heated it up and rolled it over and then squeezed it flat, it would create this sort of moire effect, which doesn't happen in the slides, but, and you can't like, oh yeah, there you go. Oh, oh, oh God, I forgot totally. Wow, yeah, these are a couple of pretty good examples. <laughs> All right, this is what, this is, this is what we've been, <laughs> this is what we've been doing lately, the last few years. Uh, here's another reticello. Uh, another um, use of the reticello was I made this standing leaf. I'm really bad about titling my work. I have never I've never uh, I don't think I guess I don't think like an artist. I think more like as a designer or just a glass blower, if you will. And um, a lot of times my wife would title these things. And these, this is called a standing leaf. I'm not sure why, <laughs> apart from the fact that it stands up. But this is a reticello standing leaf. And, um, oh, we, okay, we've moved on since then. <laughs> the newer work has these wiggly lines, which is a really big deal to figure out how to do. And it, it's not really worth mentioning. I'm just happy that I was able to realize the wiggly lines. And this one, this one actually, I saw this image earlier today when I was in here looking at the slides before everybody showed up. When I was a kid growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 60s, there was, some of you folks might remember a God's Eye. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> With yarn, two sticks, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's what's, that's, <laughs> that's what's happening here. <laughs> Okay, this, this actually I like to put in because that's like the, that's the tightest, bestest object I've ever made. <laughs> look, at the, look at the pattern. Look how good that is. 
It's like three foot tall. Okay, that neck is not the best part of that. Let's, let's go back to that. Looks big. Does Dick Marcus have that picture? He does. Yeah. Why would you ask that? I saw it. Um, I'm uh, coming to his house with him. He um, is a very dear friend. And one day, a box, like he lives on, my buddy Dick Marquis, who he just referenced, and I have several times, he lives on this island just a little bit uh, north of Seattle. It's hard to get to. And this truck showed up, and they were bringing back some work from a gallery, from a museum, and um, they said, well, can we just, like, do we have to go up to his place? Can we just drop it off here? And I was like, yeah, leave his stuff here, too, in my studio. <laughs> and... Um, I looked in the box, I cut it open, yeah. <laughs> I'm good friends with them. So I looked in the box and I was like, oh my God, it was this, it was this boat with wheels that had an elephant in it. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to get that thing without writing up a check for 34,000 bucks or whatever he wanted for it? And then just like the next week, I had an exhibition in Seattle and that piece was in the show. And Dick showed up, which was like, First time <laughs> he's ever come down for one of my shows. I think I peer pressure, I pressured him into it. And he came up to me and said, what do I got to do to get that white reticello thing? Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, done deal. <laughs> <laughs> so now, yeah, he has that in his house. Right, yeah. <laughs> and I have a thing that I wanted. Yeah. I, really <laughs> I have a b huge collection of his work. I went to Africa in 2011, before I left. I promised myself it would not influence my work. <laughs> because it's kind, of, it's kind of cliche, you know? It's like, it's been done. I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I'm a little sensitive about appropriating primitive cultures and stuff. Like, I'm not, it's just not my thing, you know? It's like, it could be, it can be uh, in, an, in an outward way you know, which in my case, it kind of was or is. But I just don't feel like making statues of African ladies and stuff after. I just don't. I just don't. It's very, it just seems very 19th century, you know, kind of safari thing-ish. And I just, and the, I'm good friends with people that have gone and done that. And I don't want to take anything away from them, but it's just not my thing. But... I got home and I started making patterns that were, I can't, I, can't, I can't dismiss the fact that I saw all this amazing sort of tapestry work, mostly patterns and colors. And um, I will say now, after this image came back to, from me, or to me from the photographer, I have no idea how I did it. <laughs> it was pretty cool, <laughs> you know. I, but I don't remember how it happened. And then I made these gourds, which are very African, because in addition to seeing the tapestry stuff I saw, I also saw uh, a lot of gourd shapes, those like natural gourd shapes, not other people's work or anything. But And then it kind of morphed into making these reticello ones, which is just a one-time thing for an exhibition last year I had. And then, and then we go into uh, doing some uh, lighting and architectural stuff. And this just takes a minute. This is the first one I did. And it hangs in the, uh, or that particular one doesn't hang in the Bullseye Gallery in Portland, Oregon. I've worked closely with Bullseye, the Bullseye Glass Company in, in Portland, Oregon over the, year, over the last 20 plus years. I've been, I'm really good friends with the, the founders of the company. And this is the original chandelier I made. Somebody saw one similar and commissioned this. I don't know who it is. They won't tell me some super secret rich person, which just means a giant Republican <laughs> in Colorado. Sorry. I didn't mean it that way. Some independent. There's a detail of the original chandelier I did. This is just born out of an interest in stuff. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Australia since I was young. I be, I'm friends with a restaurateur. He ended up becoming really famous, sold out, sorry, um, uh, was um, 
he ended up having a bigger, more, yeah, a big corporate restaurant. He called me up and asked me to do a uh, outfit his restaurant with these lights. And I was like, no thanks. <laughs> Mostly because the images that were sent to me by the architect were this guy said, here, I want, you, I want it like this. It wasn't like they were asking me. I was basically just going to execute somebody's design. I mentioned earlier that uh, my wife at the time was running everything and uh, we talked about it and I said, I don't want to do that. And that's because I was, I also mentioned earlier, I was lazy and spoiled. I also mentioned earlier that um, I worked with my friend Benjamin Moore. I wanted you to make note of one of the early slides of his platter. And um, I forget what the third point was about that. I just didn't want to do it. It was just like a homework assignment and, and I just wasn't interested. Well, as it happens, the way it unfolded, and this is a boring story, but I'm going to tell it anyways. <laughs> I went on a sojourn uh, on a, uh, to do a workshop in Scotland with, with my friend Benny, Benjamin Moore, and I helped him make one of those, his platters that I showed in the beginning. And at that moment, when I was there helping to make this platter, I realized like, oh my God, if we just stack the thing, these things up, made them yellow and orange and whatnot, it would look just like the dude's drawings. And then I, I said, Benny, would you like to collaborate on this project? <laughs> because I would have used his studio and it would have been really awkward to make basically his form to realize this Australian architect's idea. And we did. And it ended up being really good uh, business. <laughs> I mean, I'm not unproud of the stuff because of all the slides that I'm showing, this is something that I didn't actually, all I did was execute it. And, and I, I, as a maker that bears mention, you know, it's worth bringing up. And as a maker who is like, like a super professional guy who does things like I can, I can project to people in the audience that are aspiring makers themselves that you can do things like this. It's not what I want to do and it's not what I've done, but I'm happy that I did it. It was, it was good business, as I said. And then also, I was pr we nailed it so close. You can't believe it. I wish I had a picture of the, of the guy's drawing because it was amazing how close his little goofy rendering was to what we realized all because of some technique that I was a part of you know that I'd witnessed forever since I was a kid and then also was a part of in the moment when I said hey Benny <laughs> should we do this together you know and so that was that was kind of a big a big deal I mean it's not a big deal in the bigger picture of everything that I've done to me personally but it really is uh, a somewhat momentous, mom you know, a, a event in that it was like everything coming together to make everybody happy, I guess, at the end of the day, including my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> another, uh, another thing that came my way well before that was um, I was at the Pilchuck School a lot of times I spend up at the school uh, in the last 31 years, my favorite position to, to, to uh, have up at the school is to be the gaffer, as I mentioned earlier, like where I just execute designs for people. And um, I was up there working, the phone rang, and it was my wife telling me that Stu Ben Crystal had called and they wanted me to design a, 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 some barware. And uh, I was like, no, I'm not, I make things. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not going to make drawings and send them off. That's what I'm doing, right? You're interrupting me from making something that's, there's a drawing in front of me and I need to get back to work. And I said, tell them no. And when I got home from my two-week experience at Pilchuck, she said, you're doing it. <laughs> so I spent time in, my, the down, in the den drawing pictures of wine glasses and sending them off in FedEx envelopes. And then they'd come back and they'd say, oh, yeah, we'll make it a little bit more like this, that, and the other. And so I ended up doing this whole suite of barware for the Stuben Crystal Company that I never touched. I just did it. 
I did it with varying degrees of sharp. I started with a fat Sharpie and worked my way all the way down <laughs> to the really skinny ones. This particular design I did speculatively. I just thought it was a good idea. And I said, if you guys want this, uh, you can have it. Otherwise, I'm going to pimp it off to Crate and Barrel. <laughs> Which I should have done because they were like 120 bucks a stem. And Crate and Bar Barrel would have done it for 12 and I'd still be getting royalty checks. <laughs> or at least I'd like to think so. And then they did this stem, which was super popular. This was, this was the backbone of the work that I did, was that particular stem. They sold millions of those, or hun hundreds <laughs> of them. And it morphed into a candlestick. And then my favorite, the ice bucket, 900 bucks. You use it in the service of getting hammered, you know, or imbibing, I'm sorry, I should have said that. So you're gonna chip it. And they sold so many of those things. I, I, I thought it was the dumbest idea and they did really well. And then uh, these are my last few slides. I made, I made some uh, kiln cast work. I had an exhibition at the Bullseye Glass Factory or a studio in Portland. That, uh, what do we call the gallery? Bullseye Studio. Bullseye Studio. Projects. Yeah, it's morphed a couple times. And I made, uh, I had a whole exhibition. I'm friends with them, as I mentioned. I love to plug them. They're really, it's a fantastic uh, glass phenomenon, Bullseye is. And um, I did this show and I made all kinds of work. I'm only going to show the kiln cast stuff. Like the acorn, it seems like a beehive is an obvious thing to make out of beautiful honey colored glass. And then finally my furnace door of my, my glass blowing studio. How big is that? It's about, I don't know, like, no, it's like this. It's, it's tiny. It's like a foot tall. I can't remember. It's like a foot tall, but it's like 60 pounds or something. And that's my last slide. 